Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Asaf Breska, our speaker today. Asaf completed his uh, BA in Cognitive Science and Psychology at the Hebrew University and is currently doing his PhD uh, in Psychology with Leon Duell of ICNC and ELSEC. Uh, he's won numerous awards including the Presidential Scholarship and the Rector's Prize. And today he'll tell us about his work on cognitive and elect electrophysiological manifestations of implicit temporal expectations. You can probably hear me without this as well. Okay, great. Thanks, Venkat, and thanks everyone for managing to bypass the Pope and everything and be here. So what I'm going to talk about today is on uh, mechanisms of implicit timing and temporal expectation. So it's quite accepted today that the brain is proactive in the sense that it constantly attempts to predict the upcoming state of the world and prepare for it. I hope that this is the last place where I need to explain the importance of prediction in the brain. And if you just look at a simple example of driving. So we're sitting in the car and we see a man walking from the left and disappearing behind the parking car. So at this moment, there is no visual input of a person, but yet we know that what, what we should do is we should focus all our resources on this location because if not, there's a chance that we'd lose our license, right? So this kind of prediction or expectation of the spatial location of events is beneficial for us because it's very difficult for our system to simultaneously focus on the entire visual scene. We need to prioritize in space where we focus our resources. Now note that this, similar things can be said about when the man will appear. So assuming that the trajectory of crossing the road is continuous, we could also predict at what moment in time we would see the man reappearing and this is also beneficial because it's not easy for us to maintain a high level of preparation all the time. So if we can prioritize certain locations at certain time points, it's much more efficient. Now, what I'm going to try to argue is that temporal expectations are unique. That's what makes them interesting. And the reason is because they're different from other types of expectation in the mechanism. So the expectation of space or object like face or house or even feature like color or orientation are usually conceived as operating in a biased competition mechanism, okay? So presumably, let's take spatial expectation as an example. When, if, uh, when we have a neuron whose receptive field is in a spe uh, specific location in space, if we expect an event to occur in that location, we have increase in firing rate of that neuron as we, in response for the cue. So here you see in thick line the response when you're expecting the event to occur in the receptive field, and in dashed line uh, what you, with the response pattern when you expect it out of the receptive field. And we get also a similar pattern when the target does occur later in time. We have stronger firing rate when we were expecting the target at that location compared to not. So this is just one example of a mechanism of increasing the sensitivity and gains of neurons whose receptive fields include the property or location or, or object that we expect to see in the future. And we can remain in this state until this event occurs. However, for time, the story is different because it's not known, it's still under debate, some people claim that they've discovered such neurons, but it's still not that clear that we have neurons with temporal receptive fields in the sense that, like in this model, a neuron that we can, if we know that an event is about to occur in two seconds, we can increase the sensitivity of that specific neuron, which encodes two seconds. So this is not exactly still under debate, as I said, but it's not as clear that this is how it works for time as in for other properties. So how do temporal expectations do operate? So in general, there were two classes of models that tried to explain this kind of phenomena of be able, being able to prepare for a specific time in the future. And the first of which is just counting time. So this is called interval timing models or pacemaker accumulator models. And what just these models suggest is that when we have temporal expectation, 
what it means that we have stored in memory the interval between the event that we're waiting for, so say the green light, and some preceding event that has some fixed temporal contingency, fixed temporal interval between the two. So previous experience have allowed us to learn this interval, and now when we see this queue, which we'll call warning signal, we start counting time, literally, and until the interval that we have in memory is, uh, and uh, elapses or passes out, and then we know that the green light is about to occur. So people have developed more formal, a little bit more formal models for this kind of, of operation, which are, according, by their name, built on a pacemaker or a mode that, model that generates regular pulses, and these pulses are accumulated by the accumulator along the interval to a quantity of how many pulses you need for this interval, and this interval is associated with the traffic light. And then, when you now see the, red, the yellow light, you compare it the comparator mechanism between the number of pulses that you've learned before, stored in reference memory, and the number of pulses of ongoing time that are stored in working memory. So this is presumably a very explicit and intentional process. You have to you look at the traffic light, you know the time, you have to count time, you have to be very attentive. Let's try in a short demonstration to show you how flexible this ability is. So what we do in the lab is we associate different cues with different temporal intervals. So now, for example, the word short will predict a short interval to the target, and the word long will predict a long interval to the target. Okay, let's look at it again and try to memorize and learn the intervals. So this is the short, and this is the long. So now try to clap your hands or knock on the chair or something when the black target appears and try to use the predictive clue. Try to use the predictive information in the queue. Ready? Okay. Okay. You're a bit early. Okay, so that was an invalid trial. So what we usually get in these kind of paradigms is a validity effect. So when the target appears at an unexpected time, your responses are much, much slower if indeed you believe the queue and you use it to form temporal prediction. However, in real life, it doesn't really work like that too often. There aren't many situations in which we know specific intervals between events and have clear warning signal and we invest resources in counting time if you take back the example of driving, here the driver and pedestrian need to on, ongoingly cal perform calculations of what's called time to collision in order to decide whether they want to slow down, speed up, or maybe freeze and scream. So they do these calculations without explicitly thinking about time. This is at least our subjective feeling when we drive or when we cross the road. But they do it by extracting temporal regularities and temporal information, sorry, from the temporal regularities in the environment. So the kind of temporal regularities that I'm going to focus in is on rhythms, which are interesting because they're very prevalent in all sorts of biological stimuli, like motion, speech, music, dance, all have a very wrist, strong rhythmic pattern. And this is called exogenous temporal expectations because they are based on temporal information that comes outside of the, the source of temporal information is outside from the observer. The previous temporal expectations, I didn't t say that, based on interval timing are often termed endogenous <coughs> temporal expectations. So let's see how it looks like. So if we present a rhythm of uh, stimuli, responses are better when the target appears in phase with the rhythm or with identical interval to the rhythm interval than in here, when it's too early and surprising. Now, to explain this phenomenon, people have proposed a very different kind of model, terms entrainment models. So accord according to such models, every neural system has internal oscillations between peaks of high sensitivity and low sensitivity. So usually these kind of oscillations are random, but when provided with some kind of external rhythmic stimulus, these oscillations become synchronized with the external rhythmicity. So this is entrainment, phase and period correction of the oscillations that could start at different uh, frequencies than the external stimulation. And eventually, 
the, the internal oscillations are aligned such that the high peaks of sensitivity align with the onset of the rhythmic stimuli. And what you get is that if you hypothesize that if you pre uh, present an event at the time of the rhythm, you're at a high state of preparation, and this is why your responses should be better than when you present it too early or too late. And this is indeed the kind of pattern you get in experiments like these. You get that if you present a target at the expected rhythm interval, here it's high, it's good, because it's accuracy, you get better responses compared to when you present it outside of the rhythm. Yeah. What is the task here? So by energy for instance? Oh, no, the, the task here was, in, in this specific experiment, was a two-tone discrimination, so it's not something, I mean, I'm going to show only simple reaction time tasks, so everything is going to be reaction time. But you'd expect to have high preparation at, at this, at the time point of the rhythmic stimulus. Perhaps I didn't understand the, mm -hmm. <coughs> the model, but um, can, can, you, can you explain again the model? So this is a, this has started as a conceptual, you know, cognitive model, and with time gained uh, evidence from, from intracranial recording that show this kind of modulation of the phase of internal oscillation. I'm going to question that soon, but in general what people think is that every neural system has, uh, cannot maintain high sensitivity for a, prolonged, uh, for a prolonged time, so what you have is you have some kind of oscillatory dynamics. This is based on, this is intuition? This is, this originally was based on, I think, just behavioral experiments like inhibition of return patterns and stuff like that, which show that this is, this is old cognitive work, like uh, 60s, 70s work. And with years and... Showing that there is, there is uh, over time, there is uh, the fluctuations in, in, the, in the accuracy or... In yeah, so okay. today, so today people who had exactly your concern are trying to do works in which they present targets at very, very high resolution with very small uh, intervals and you can actually see a pattern of uh, oscillation in your performance. So you have high performance, high stage of high performance and low performance. And high performance, if you present the stimuli close enough in time so you can have <coughs> the resolution for that. Some people claim... You have it. To yeah, yeah no, but, but even if you don't, even if you just present one stimulus, and this stimulus elicits phase resetting maybe, uh, so you can see these kind of patterns of even behavior. But th I agree, this is just a conceptual model and there's a lot of circumstantial evidence and we want, this is one of the things that I'm going to try to look deeper into. So, right. So this, this kind of background story that I've told you is a story of a traditional <coughs> distinction between temporal expectations that are based on rhythm, which are presumably in, uh, in incidental and based on entrainment and thus the representation of time is implicit. You don't have to know, to, to memorize the time in some way. And in contrast, when there's no regularity in the environment, you have to, in order to form temporal expectations, you have to operate through interval timing mechanisms. So you need to have an explicit representation of the interval. You need to intentionally count time. You're doing it based on pacemaker accumulator models, which are much more based on memory than on just synchronizing with the stimulus without thinking about it. And this is where we came in, and, and our problem with this kind of distinction was that many of the experiments which tested the effects of rhythm used rhythms that were predictive. In this just, just a clarification mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. So when I turn on my computer, mm -hmm. it takes some time until I see the you know, future of the password. Mm -hmm. So this would go into interval timing? Yeah, because you don't have l like external, y y your temporal, the source of your temporal information is your memory. You but know. It's not, well, it, it, uh, it feels like something implicit and not explicit. If you wanted to be prepared exactly when the uh, insert your password uh, operates, you want to improve in that, what you need to do is to notice next time, try to estimate how long it takes you, and then in the time after that, try to reproduce that time, right? Because you don't have, I think that the distinction is here that whenever you have external regularity that you can synchronize to, you can do it like completely without thinking that you're doing timing, thinking about time or anything like that. And if not, if this is not the case, what you have to do if you want to be prepared on time is to count time. But the wants to say that there is some uh, <coughs> explicit uh, regularity 
reality in the time for this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. The time between turning on definitely, the definitely. So there is information and there is entrainment. Def- so it's maybe intrinsic. I think that the way that people think about entrainment is they think about something that's very local. You know, you think about speech. You hear my speech now, and presumably your brain automatically knows when to be ready for the next utterance. This, I agree with you. Yeah. It's what people tend to do, but I tend to disagree with you. Yeah. Uh, me, me too. Yeah. Me, me too. Yeah, me too. But, but this, this has been like traditional taxonomy that is accepted both in psychology and neuroscience community. There's, I'll show you evidence soon for both, and give me a few more minutes. Yes? Right, that was prediction based on dynamics. Definitely, yeah. that was... Um, that, that's under debate because when you see motion, you don't sample the world continuously. Some people say that the sampling of the world, of the world is also in temporal intervals and what you actually perceive is, I mean, you do, your brain does the, the correction to feel that the motion is flo- flowing, but what you actually perceive is these snapshots of the man progressing. But this is, for me, if something is based on dynamics, on regular and predictable dynamics, that's th- this side of, of, of the model. And, and the rhythms are just a way to do it much, ac- much more accurately and, and easy in the lab. But I agree that, for example, motion is a very strong cue for prediction, and you could ask whether it works by entrainment of some serially positioned neurons in, that are spatially mapped when you perceive the motion. Excuse me to, to not answer my question. Mm-hmm. No, 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 no. <laughs> there's this a very is nice study from like a decade ago by Marshall Schuller and Mark Burr where the uh, animals are trained to respond to a, a cue, a visual cue. With, uh, 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 they're, they're trained that there will be a reward either three or six seconds mm-hmm. after the queue and, and this has happened many times in, in, in the study they looked at the, at, at, the, at the neural activity in the visual cortex and, and, and how it encodes the, the interval timing so this would correspond to explicit to this interval timing or this would correspond yeah this to would correspond to interval timing because you don't have a local pattern that you could synchronize to so I guess my problem is with <coughs> explicit and implicit right this is my problem too I, I agree so, but this, this or yeah, or yeah. So, so th- this, this, <laughs> uh, but, but, bear, bear in mind that this was like when you see reviews about temporal expectations, they all say when you're exposed to rhythmic patterns, your expectations are formed um, explicit, uh, implicitly and incidentally, and when you're exposed to interval timing, you have to um, want to to be prepared at the right time. It doesn't happen out of the blue. I mean, if you don't want to be prepared in three seconds you will not be. Unless you do so much training that you create an association that's already automatic, right? I mean, in the paradigm that you've just described, or in the short long that I've just showed you, you chose to to take short as a cue for it was half a second. Nothing made you be prepared in half a second other than you wanting to increase your preparation at that time. And what people think is that in rhythmic context, it's not like that. It doesn't matter what you want. You're exposed to rhythm, you're prepared at the times of the rhythmic stimuli, and, and, and it doesn't depend on whether you want to be prepared at that time or not. Yeah, so this is, this is like concept, uh, actually, okay, uh, in a second. So the problem with that was that it was not based on data. It was based on thinking of how these things should operate, but the data was actually problematic in that sense, because most of the experiments that tested the effects of rhythms used rhythms that were predictive. So there were either synchronization, tapping experiments in which you know that the stimulation is, a, is rhythmic and stays like that and you just <coughs> synchronize with it, or perceptual experiments in which, for example, see this experiment here. So here participants had to respond to this target. It's uh, circled here with pink. It wasn't circled like that in the experiment. It's, you see that it's different from the other targets, from the other uh, stimuli. And the train of stimuli could be in one, ch- in one class of trials regular and in another class of trials irregular. So you see the time intervals between stimuli here and here. 
So what happens in this paradigm, and this is very common in this field, is that once a trial begins and the participant sees that the stimuli appear rhythmically, he knows that there's 100% validity that the target will also appear in phase with the rhythm. So you can't attribute the facilitation that's observed here in the rhythmic condition relative to irregular condition to something that's done automatically because the participant has an incentive to focus himself to these times. Okay? And this is also raises the question of whether we can even say that something here is unique to rhythmicity. How do we know that what happens here is not that participants do some kind of learn the interval, the 400 millisecond interval, and just apply it repeatedly. So they say, okay, it's now, 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 now. Okay? It's not something that you just, they see it and their brain is engaged with this dynamics incidentally. Okay? So our aim in the studies I'll show you was to try to to th rethink about this traditional distinction and disentangle these two factors in temporal expectation. So the source, whether there is indeed some kind of external information or regularity that you can synchronize to, or whether it's just all... Hmm? No? Yeah, okay. Or whether it's just all based on, on endogenous memory-based processes, and the level of intentionality, so whether you intend to, to use the, this cue to create expectations or whether they operate automatically. So and specifically to understand this, we wanted to see can we create a situation in which temporal expectations will be created incidentally and whether, if we can show that, whether it matters whether expectations in a rhythm, based on rhythms are created incidentally or intentionally. Okay, so when we compare rhythm-based expectations that are on one hand in incidental, like I'm going to show you in a second, and intentional, like we saw in the previous slide, whether there's a difference in any way. And third, when we look at expectations that are formed intentionally, whether there's a difference between whether they are based on rhythms or on memorizing intervals. So whether the source matters when they're both done intentionally. Yeah, works? Great. Okay. So to test the correlates of uh, temporal expectations with high resolution, we use DG, and specifically we looked at three correlates, known correlates of, of forming temporal expectation, each pointing to a different stage in this process, presumably. So first, when we expect an event to occur, there is usually a negative ERP, negative defliction in central electrodes called the CNV, contingent negative variation. I'm not sure you've heard about it. So here, for example, there's a Q at this time point, and then there's a target either here or here. And we see that there's, after the initial response to the Q, there's a buildup of negativity um, as you progress in time towards the target. Now, the nice thing about the CNV is that its trajectory reflects the time that you expect. So if you know when the target is about to appear, the CNV becomes negative faster when you expect an earlier target. So this is the thick line here is for the... 600 millisecond target, and the dashed line is for the 1400 millisecond target. So we can use this as a proxy for when you expect the target to appear, early or late. Second, just before the target appears, there's a reduction in amplitude or power of alpha band oscillations, which is something we can measure over the cortex, the, the sensory cortex that's processing the input. So in our experiments, everything is visual, so we measure it over occipital cortex. You see, this is from a previous work, that when you present stimuli rhythmically, just prior to the onset of the stimulus, there's a reduction in uh, alpha band oscillation, power amplitude here, of alpha of power, sorry, in uh, power of alpha band oscillation, which is, in this study, just before the expected time of the stimulus, which is marked here in dashed line. Some other studies find it at the time of the stimulus, so a bit later. And finally, after the target has appeared, there is usually a positive defliction, positive ERP, termed P3, which is associated usually with stimulus evaluation and response selection. And this, the, the question about this? Okay. And, and this P3 is earlier. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Alpha is 8 to 12, 8 to 13. Sorry, I didn't say that. 
military. Yes, so this is... And this is uh, what everybody yeah, is so trying to mm -hmm. measure increase in power within 100 millisecond window. No, but it, it, this is instantaneous power that's calculated using a moving window FFT or I think wavelet transformation here. So you find sometimes that... I agree with you that this is very, very narrow. So this result was very, I wouldn't say, uh, uh, surprising for us that it can be that narrow. But this is different between two conditions. So this is just a difference between them. And when, when the alpha power that I'm going to show you, things are much more smeared in time, as you'd expect. Yeah, this is, this is, yeah, but this is the definitely. We looked at this, and I was like, wow, I wish I got such narrow uh, in time, things that are such narrow in time. Okay, so just to finish up this up, so the, um, after the target has uh, appeared, there's usually this positive P3, and the P3 is earlier in latency when the target is temporarily expected compared to unexpected. So this is assumed to be to reflect the fact that target processing is more efficient so you can reach the stage of stimulus evaluation to say, okay, this is the target. I need to respond earlier because you, predict, you, you could predict when the target would, would occur. Okay. So in the first study, we aim to, to find whether rhythms affect temporal expectations incidentally. And also, is it different when, from when intentionally synchronizing with rhythms? So in order to do this, we, we used the st standard paradigm, but modified it a little bit. So we presented a sequence of rhythmic stimuli, followed by a warning signal. So participants knew that the target would only appear after this signal, and then the target. And we had several intervals, but the, the catch here was that the target could appear either in phase with the rhythm, as here, or out of phase with the rhythm, as too early, here, with equal probability. So the rhythm was not predictive of when the target would appear. Now, we didn't settle for that. In addition, we wanted to control what participants were intentionally doing. So what we did was, concurrently, we used the color queuing, which was valid and predictive, in order to give them information of when to expect the target, okay? So I'll walk you through it. So here we have a green color. So this color predicts that the target would appear at the short interval here. And the red color predicts that the target appears at the long interval, which is somewhere here. So these trials were all valid trials for the participants because for them this was green color and short interval target. And these were invalid trials because it was red color, so they expected the target somewhere here, but then it was too early, just like I showed you before in the example. But for us, what was interesting was the fact that this trial is also valid in, in f with the rhythm, and this trial is invalid with the rhythm. Although participants did not use the rhythm, it was not task relevant, and it was not predictive in any way. Okay? And what we find is, First, the participant, if we look at behavior, this is reaction times, participants indeed used the, the, the color, sorry, to form temporal expectations. So we see this by faster responses when the target was expected based on color compared to when it was unexpected based on color. However, when the target appeared incidentally in phase with the rhythm, responses were faster both when the target was expected based on the color and when it was unexpected, and these two effects were additive. So there was the, the effect did not occur only when you were not expecting, when, when the target appeared at the surprising location, well, temporal location for the participants, but also when the target appeared where they already predicted it to appear based on the color cue. Now, the neural correlate of this effect was found in the CNV. So what you see here is two conditions in which the target appeared at the short interval, so 700 milliseconds. This is the warning signal and this is the target. And the color cue was valid. So participants expected the target to appear at this temporal location. Uh, but still we see that uh, the CNV was modulated by the preceding rhythm. So when the preceding rhythm was long, which is the dashed line here, the CNV was later in latency, as if the rhythm causes you to start preparing later for a later target, and just as a suggestion, I just plotted here the long into where the long interval target should have been, and you can see that the trajectory of the CNV it goes to reach the peak somewhere here. We assume that the, they reach the peak at the same amplitude, 
So later on, and more be prepared for the long interval target and not the short interval target. The thick line here is when the rhythm was short. So it was agreeing with the, with the color cueing as to where the target would appear. Okay? Cool. Now, note that in the P3, so after the target has appeared, there's a P3, but there's no effect on P3 latency for whether the rhythm was agreeing with the target time or not agreeing. So whether the rhythm was valid or invalid, incidentally, didn't matter for the P3. So the stimulus evaluation processes were not affected by whether you incidentally fall in phase or out of phase with the rhythm. So you're saying that the difference in amplitude is uh, not relevant? This, no, th this was not. You were talking about this thing? Yes. Yeah, but it was not, it wasn't substantial. But what, what, usually, what you usually find for temporal expectation uh, phenomena is a shorter latency of the P3. So it's as if you're finishing to process the stimulus faster. Right. So what happens in, uh, when you intentionally use the rhythm? So what we did is in separate blocks, we reversed the contingencies such that the rhythm was predictive. So the target had 75% probability to appear in phase with the rhythm. And the color was non-predictive, so the color was 50-50. What we find is, first, that there was a much stronger behavioral effect of appearing in phase compared to out of phase with the rhythm. So now the rhythm is on the x-axis, so this effect is almost 100 milliseconds, and the incidental effect of rhythm was something like 20 milliseconds. But there's no effect of incidentally appearing in phase with the color. So this suggests that the effect of rhythm is not something that caused you to pass confusion or something because that should have happened maybe to a similar extent here, but due to something automatic that the rhythm exerts. And when we look at, at the, the uh, EEG correlates of temporal expectation, so we had the similar CMV effect as before, but this is not surprising because now you're using the rhythm to form expectation and it was not modulated by the color congruently with the behavioral effect, but there was a latency effect on the P3. So here we see that when the rhythm was, when the target was valid, so it appeared at the expected time, this P3 latency was much earlier compared to when the target was invalid. So this is the standard effect of earlier P3 latency. It was obtained only when intentionally using the rhythm to form expectation and not when the rhythm affects you automatically without intending to. A similar pattern was also found for the alpha amplitude. So what you see here is um, two conditions in which the target appeared at the late interval. So this is the warning signal, and this is the target time, okay? But in, in black, participants uh, were exposed to a short rhythm. So they were expecting a target here, and in gray, participants were expecting a long rhythm, so it's, they were expecting the target here. So what we see is that after the warning signal, there's a very strong desynchronization because now participants know, okay, the next one is the target, so it's a very strong response. But if you look at anticipatory alpha reduction in alpha amplitude, we see that when expecting the target here, which is the black line, there is much reduced amplitude compared to when expecting the target later. Note that after the target was omitted, participants reorient their expectation and there's another desynchronization here. And this is the desynchronization that participants were expecting. They were expecting a target at the long interval. So after the initial reduction, there's a return to baseline. And here starts the desynchronization that the pre-target desynchronization. As you said, I don't show here the time frequency plot, but this is much wider than, than uh, 100 milliseconds. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the no tap yeah. Did you see the same thing? No, so we didn't. So for when the rhythm was for the, the block where rhythm affected incidentally, there was no such effect. So when the so when when participants were not intentionally synchronizing to the rhythm, we didn't see this difference. Okay, so this is something that was unique to when you intentionally want to synchronize yourself with the rhythm and prepare yourself at the time of the listening stream. Choice of alpha was based on rhythm targets or something? Yeah, because for me, yeah. alpha is doesn't. I don't understand. Yeah. Is, is the first choice to study first of 
like you just use the term synchronization. Yeah, so this is this is the kind of I I, I, I alternate between saying synchron no synchronization with the rhythm. I understand. So yeah, some people know. So some yeah. people say that the differences in alpha amplitude reflect more or less synchronization of neurons that operate in alpha frequency. That I don't want to say because I don't I don't believe that we still that we already know what these kind of modulations of alpha really mean, but we know what they're associated with. So you can see also in studies of, say, uh, spatial attention, that when you, expect, when you get a cue that you expect a target at the left side, you have a reduction in alpha amplitude over the contralateral occipital uh, cortex. So people thinking about alpha is something that when there is high amplitude of alpha, it means that the brain is in maybe an idle state or in a less sensitive state. And when there is re a reduction in amplitude, the explanation is that there is desynchronization, which reflects that neurons are working and expecting or something. I don't know if I take the desynchronization mechanism here as, as you know. <coughs> question about this? The rhythm frequency is either 1.4 hertz or 0.7. Yeah. This is this is something that, that, that this maybe I should have shown you. This effect is very concentrated to the alpha band. It doesn't you don't see like a wide response, wide reduction in all frequencies. You see just like I showed you in, in the night in the two nights figure before. It's something that's concentrated in frequency and time. I have a question again. Maybe it's a better question for the discussion. Can you go one, one side back? So, so the to this one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So w w one, um, going back to the, to the behavior, one interpretation would be that, I mean, if, if, if we would have believed that the brain is in some sense optimal and only using uh, uh, relevant information, then we would have been surprised by this result because reason, you learn something about the statistics of the world that is irrelevant to the task in hand. No. But only that, but, but you do know that there is, implicitly, you do know that there is, high, if, if you were just exposed to rhythm, you know that there is hyper, if you look across time, yeah. the distribution of probability that if that when would the next thing would occur, then the highest probability, given that you have no other source of information, is at the time that coincides with the rhythm. In general, yes, but not in this Right, no, but not exactly. Right. Now the question is, so there is something special, well, now the question is, is there, some, is it, is there something special uh, with respect to the rhythm? So for example, if you do something that uh, is, if you would use a slightly more uh, uh, complicated statistic, would you learn it? Yes, it's, I, will, I will stop to say that this is an excellent choice because this was, this is exactly okay. the next study. So what, what Jonathan asked was exactly the thing that was, that we were concerned about. So. Is there something unique about rhythms? Is it really something that has to do with rhythmicity or whether when you form intentionally expectations, even in not rhythmic sequences, but which provide you with the temporal information, would you get the same result? So this, is, this was exactly the next step because when we looked at it, we were like, well, okay, but how do we know that it's something unique to rhythms? When uh, we sent this paper, all the, we have a reviewer from the entrainment side of the map, and he said, well, why don't you say we have new evidence for entrainment because we show the mathematic effect of rhythm. And we, we said, well, but it's not an evidence for entrainment. You think that rhythm means entrainment, so for you, it's mathematic effect of entrainment. But it doesn't have to be that way, okay? So what we wanted in the second study was to dissociate between uh, the effect of rhythms and, and uh, interval timing when they're both intention performed intentionally. So previous studies, as we said, assume that when rhythms are predictive and you synchronize to them, we, um, this synchronization is accompanied by entrainment, as I showed you, and this is expressed in increased phase locking of slow oscillations that are in the frequency of the rhythm to the rhythmicity. So when you look at target time, you're supposed to see that all the delta low frequency oscillations are locked to the to a specific phase, which would be the preferred phase of this participant. 
Okay? This is like the general conception. And what we asked was, is this something that's really unique to rhythm? Because it could be that even that what you do is, would you get more uh, exposures to this fixed interval of the rhythm, you can form a better representation of this interval, and you can apply it more accurately. So this is why you're more prepared at these times. It has nothing to do with synchronization with the rhythm. So the question was, is intentional use of rhythm more than just repeated application of interval timing mechanism? And to test this, we did exactly what you suggested. We created a condition which was not rhythmic, but was identical to the rhythm condition in the terms of the temporal information. So this was the standard rhythm condition in which stimuli appeared rhythmically, there was a warning signal, and then the target had high probability to appear in phase in with the rhythm, which is the green uh, target here, compared to out of phase, which is the light, gray, light green here. So this is the standard intentional predictive rhythm. What we did was to create what we call a repeated interval condition in which we presented pairs of stimuli, so black, red, black, red, such that the interval within pair was always identical and the interval between pair was random. And participants were informed that the interval between the warning signal and the target would be identical to the interval within pair, so they should try to learn it and apply it when they see the warning signal. So this condition also has a dynamic stimulation, dynamic presentation of the stimuli, and it's not rhythmic, but it still provides the same amount of temporal information regarding to when the target is about to appear. Okay? And we also had a, oops, we also had a, a control condition in which the intervals were random, just in order to see what happens when we don't have any temporal prediction. So what we found was that, as expected, when targets appeared in phase with the rhythm, responses were faster compared to when they appeared in the, in the random condition, suggesting that you form the temporal expectation. However, when targets appeared at the expected time in the repeated interval condition, there was also facilitation compared to random, which was not different from the rhythm condition. So this facilitation does not reflect something unique to rhythmicity, it just reflects the fact that you have a temporal expectation. Now the difference between conditions was found in the cost of appearing out of rhythm, so the cost of surprising stimuli. So we see that for the rhythm condition, when targets appear too early or too late, reaction times were much slower than in the repeated interval condition. Okay? So to understand this pattern, what we can do is we can plot a hypothetical distribution of preparation as function of time assuming that preparation is inversely related to reaction time. So the faster you respond means that you have higher preparation. And what we see here is that the two conditions do not differ in the level of preparation at the time of the target, but they differ in the accuracy of the temporal expectation that is formed. So in rhythm, you really expect the target only here and not here. And in interval, you're a bit more uh, flexible. Okay. Now, the neural correlates of this effect were found in the CNV. So this is the anticipation period, this is the warning signal, and this is the target. What I'm presenting you here is the rhythmic condition in which targets appeared at the long interval. In green is where the rhythm predicted the long interval, and we see the CNV building up and reaching its peak about the time of the target. However, in red, we see it is the condition when the rhythm predicted a short interval, but the target appeared at the long interval. So it's an invalid condition in which there was an omission. And what we see is that there's a buildup of the CNV peaking at the expected time of the target, but then there's a reversal of trajectory, which is usually termed CNV resolution. And you see that it's very accurate on the time in which the target was expected to appear. If we compare this to the repeated interval condition, it's the same color scheme, we see that when the target was expected at a short interval, so the red ERP here, we indeed see a buildup of the CNV up until the time of the target, but then there's no immediate return to baseline. There's something more delayed or prolonged here before the return to baseline starts. So I, of course I picked the parameters so that they would look the same, but I urge you to see that the similarity between the 
hypothetical distribution of preparation in time and the ERPs that we obtain, obtained in these two conditions. Okay? Cool. Now, what we wanted to do is we wanted to really understand what's different between the conditions and what's, the, what's very common to do here is to fit regression lines to the buildup and resolution of the CMV to see whether there's a difference in the slope. So whether maybe one condition, in the Whitney condition, there's a faster, stronger buildup of the temporal expectation. However, what previous studies done, has done was to just decide a priori that the buildup is from here to here and the resolution is from here to here. So while in the rhythmic condition this looks okay, in the repeated interval condition we see that this might have very strong influence on the results because if we say that the buildup is up to here, then we have a very steep buildup but not that steep resolution. But if we say that the buildup is up to here, then we have not that steep buildup, but very steep resolution. So we didn't want to choose parameters that would affect the uh, slopes that we find. What we did instead was we fitted models of the, of the raw amplitude of the CMV to these two waveforms, so the red here and the red here. And then we compared these models using uh, Bayesian uh, model selection. So one model had three parameters, the time point where the CMV begins after the evoked potential, the slope of the buildup, and the slope of the resolution, and the time point of reversal was fixed to 700 milliseconds. That's the time of expected target uh, occurrence. This is what previous studies have done. We added two more models. One model in which we allowed the transition point to be a free parameter. So we had the start time, the slope, some time point at which there's a change and the reversal, and another model in which we allowed for a delay between the termination of the rise of the, of the buildup of the CNV and the onset of the resolution of the CNV. So this, this model had five parameters, and to compare them, we calculated Bayesian information criterion and Nakaike information criterion for each of the models and picked the model with the lowest value. What you can see is that for the rhythmic condition, this analysis preferred the less complex model. So the four parameter model was better compared to the five parameter model. But for the repeated interval condition, this analysis preferred the five parameter model. So uh, um, uh, build up, delay, and then resolution of the CMV. So this, this actually gives us the first indication that indeed the difference between these two conditions is in your ability to delay between the buildup and the resolution, which is present here and not present here. Okay. Can you explain better what, 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 what are the models here? So I mean, just, just uh, assuming Gaussian noise. And yes, exactly. exactly. This, is, this is usually how you fit a regression model. So if you wanted to fit a regression model from, say, think of this one. So this is what people usually do. They say uh, participants expected a target at 700 milliseconds. I'm going to fit a regression model from here to 700 and from 700 to 1300. So this is also un uh, under assumptions of Gaussian noise. This is the regression standard assumption. So in that sense, we didn't change anything from just fitting a regression model. The only thing is that we didn't want to a priori set. So you compute the comp comp reg regression and then you compute the likelihood? Yeah, so we did uh, an exhaustive search in this in the parameter space until we get the best fit for these for each of these three models for each of the two conditions. And you then also, so you also have the noise for the parameter. You also the noise. So, so, so yeah, so so this is th th this is across all subjects. So this is assumed. So the noise here is the ERPs that I'm showing you. All this fitting was conducted at the group level, not a single subject level. Within subject comparison, so you can assume that it has the same noise in both conditions. This is just to simplify yeah. it. You know, it's, 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 I, I'd be very happy to hear if you can give us some advice on, on what else can be done here because we, we, we initially we ran this, we ran the standard analysis in which we just decided that the transition point is at 700, and this was a bit, a bit fun. Okay, so just to go over this swiftly. What, what do we learn from the fact that the five parameter model is, is better at, uh, 
these information criteria for this for this uh, condition and that the other model is better for that condition. So the way I would like to interpret it <coughs> is this is that when we use when uh, when sample expectation is built in a based on your memory a repeated application of your memorized interval, this is something that's more flexible. So once you've reached the peak and the target is not there, you can still wait. And in the rhythmic condition, you can. You're switching between an on and off mode, and when the target did not appear at the, when you were supposedly at the on stage, you can't, you, you know that it might appear here. You know that it's better for you to wait, but you can't. And what was the delay between the expected time and the model time? Between? Of the switch. So no, no, so it's a great question. So we also compared all the parameters using jackknifing procedures, and what we found that the only parameter that was different between the repeated interval and the rhythmic uh, condition, of course, we fitted the five-parameter model to both because we needed it for this condition. So the only parameter that was different was this time point, the time point of, switch of starting the resolution, and there was no difference either in the slope of buildup or in the slope of resolution. Did you look at sequence effects here? Uh, we built the experiment such that we, counterba we counterbalance this. It's very important because in temporal expectation experiments, this is a very strong source of, of is a very strong effect. Because one, one interpretation is that you have this uh, V-shape here, but it, 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 the, the, the try to try viability in the location uh, of the, sh of mm -hmm. the minimum. No, that we, well, that we did not analyze. Uh, All parts of that and type of subject. Yes. Yeah. Right, right, no, right, that's right, that's right. So this is where we do the jet knifing procedure to estimate these parameters. We can't estimate it within single subject because that's too noisy, but we can How reduce. How noisy is the thing in private? Too noisy. You, yeah. don't, you don't, some people claim that the CNV is something like what's recently been claimed for the readiness potential, that it's not the buildup, but it's, a set of this is more or less a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but the statistics of the averaging may screw mm -hmm. up the whole idea of the mm -hmm. model because mm -hmm. right. you don't know. Right, but still, these uh, these two conditions are completely identical in terms of the, I mean, for between what happened here, there was a warning signal here and the target here, and you expected in red the target to appear here, and it didn't appear, so they're completely identical in that sense. Yeah, but there is the problem of the variability, inter-tribal yeah, variability, yeah, definitely. because in Ripley, you really create less variable condition for the perception of time. Yeah. And here, because of this exactly. variable inter interval, you cannot learn better than what you learn from the stimuli themselves. Right. I think this is exactly what we claim. This is, this, is, this is what we want to say here, that this is what's unique about Ripley. And I'll just show you quickly because this is interesting. So Actually, we did don't, run run don't let your fingers on the back. I know. We don't let Can you go, go back? back. Sure. So th this model, the left hand side model, is nested within the right hand right. model. Right. So if you had enough data, mm -hmm. if you had taken more subjects and more trials, all of them would have had this shape. Because the, the, the more data points you have, the, the uh, more. Um, Right. The more palm, the, the, the more attractive would be the many parameters. Right. Well, so this is why this initially we used the uh, AIC, and then we we when I didn't get got a bit deeper into this, we turned to the BIC as well because it's more punishing punishing for more parameters. So we want to make sure that we don't get these effects just because. So the interpretation is more problematic. It could be that there could be differences in the level of noise that could account for. Maybe this is something that, that uh, we can talk about and, and it would be really great. Mm -hmm. Right, right. But this, this is for the interpretation of waiting. Mm -hmm. Right, and right. What, what, we want we, that what we want to say is that here it's more flexible in terms of, I don't care if it's source of less vari more variability or your ability to <coughs> intentionally say, okay, now it didn't occur, but I wait. So this is this is something that, that that definitely this experiment doesn't uh, doesn't distinguish between these two options. Okay. So just the last thing I want to show you, really quick, is not this, and we just say this in a sentence. 
So there was no difference between the condition in the P3 latency effect or in the alpha uh, power reduction effect. And this suggests, as in the previous experiment, that these effects do not reflect something unique to rhythmicity, but something unique to intentionally forming temporal expectations. And when you match the amount of temporal information, there is no difference between them. But what's interesting is the hallmark of entrainment, delta phase locking. So we follow the standard analysis that everyone in this field does. You apply a narrow band filter of delta on the ongoing signal, you apply Hilbert transform to get instantaneous phase, and take the phases at the time of the target. According to entrainment model, these phases are supposed to be uh, uh, concentrated around the preferred phase, because that's what you do. Your internal oscillation become locked to the stimulation. So first, as, as other studies, we found that there is a correlation between the phase at target time and reaction time. So there was a preferred phase for performance when the phase was about minus five or five. The reaction times were faster compared to when the phase was zero. Now, if we look at phase histograms, at, and as control, I show you one of the warning signals, so not the target, we see that the phase is completely uniformly distributed. So there's no preference for a specific phase. When we look at the random condition, there's already a beginning of some uh, preference for the phase of pi, which is the preferred phase. And when we look at the rhythm condition, there's very strong preference for a phase of pi. You see a very strong phase concentration for the preferred phase. So here we go. We have entrainment of delta band oscillation to the preferred phase at target time. Yes. What's the line? What's the dots? And the, so the dots are are uh, reaction times in this condition sorted according to phase, and this is moving window average. Sorry, I went over this fast because I wanted to reach to. Like it's an average of those dots. It of of yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is this is one what best typical topic. Okay. <laughs> now the, the 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 thing here is that in the repeated interval condition we found exactly the same thing. So there was phase concentration to the preferred phase, which was not different between the rhythmic and repeated interval condition. So this hallmark of entrainment has nothing to do with entrainment. All it means is that when you apply a narrow band filter, and assuming that you have a CFV, which has a negative peak at the time of the target, as we've seen, when you apply a narrow band filter on that, it looks like an oscillation, or maybe people don't even look, but when you take the phase, it's not the phase of the oscillation, it's the phase of the momentary CMV. You don't see, when you present the rhythm in this experiment, you don't see an ongoing oscillation in the raw signal. But when you apply a narrow band filter, of course that the CMV would look like a oscillatory pattern. So this is uh, very something that we were not sure how if we believe it, but went through several controls and, and now we, I dare show it. We're not, uh, I showed it in a content of entrainment and time perception, and they were not nice like you. Okay, so I'll jump over this. this, this, this. And we'll just say, summarize that. So what I showed you is that rhythmic input exerts an automatic bias of temporal expectation, <coughs> and when you synchronize to it, you have high temporal accuracy or less ability to disengage but you have something that's unique to rhythm, and this is all manifested in the CMV pattern, and that the P3 and alpha oscillations, which are also correlates of temporal expectation, don't have anything to do with rhythm, but have to do with intentionally forming expectation and being prepared for the target at that time, regardless of the source, and that delta phase locking is maybe is not the good correlate just to claim that there is entrainment but maybe we have to look for on and off stages like that in the, in the sense that our perception is driven by external stimulation and not look at the phase of this oscillation. And that's it. Okay. Thank you.